Duluth, Minnesota. And as the 1800s expired and the 1900s began, a great upheaval in the Great Lakes maritime industry was taking place. Rockefeller interests had swallowed up more than 100 lake boats and formed the Pittsburgh Steamship Company. And it was being directed from here by this man, Augustus B. Wolven. Originally, when he was offered the position to direct the fleet, he declined because the Pittsburgh Steamship Company wanted him to move to Cleveland. Wolven had a number of other business ties, as well as a new home that he had built in Duluth. And he was unwilling to uproot his family and move. In a matter of days, the Steel Trust hired James Gailey for that same position. But he immediately contacted Wolven and told him that he could manage the Pittsburgh fleet from Duluth, as well as his other business interests. That worked for Wolven, who also had his eye set on a shipping mode other than just iron ore and coal. The Canadian Canal System allowed for the movement of grain from Lake Superior ports all the way down to Montreal. Of course, there had been vessels running this route since the first well and canal opened in 1829. But Wolven wanted a dedicated fleet of new steel steamers to do that job. He would then play a chess-like game with them every season to gain the maximum profits by way of the maximum efficiency and reliability. His boats would be constructed to squeeze effectively into the locks of the third Welland Canal. Each lock was 270 feet long, 44 feet wide, and 14 feet in depth. Wolven's boats were 255 feet in overall length, 41 feet in beam, and when not transiting the Welland, they could be loaded to a depth of 15 feet. They were easily recognized by their highly sheared deck, submarine stern, and truncated coal bunker. They all had the same raised pilot house with its three forward-facing windows that were externally lowered into sills. Each of these steel-hulled boats also had large wooden fender strakes that ran along the hull. These provided the boat's steel hull plates protection from the tight fit within the stone lock walls of the Welland. Contracting to four different shipyards in 1902, Wolven ordered a total of ten such canalers. And he wanted them up and running by the autumn of 1903. These boats would become known as the Wolven Class Canalers. Now it is sometimes said that every one of these boats was launched without a christening ceremony. That, as you'll soon see, is incorrect. The first of the fleet was the James S. Keefe, launched at 3 o'clock on the afternoon of Saturday, January 31, 1903, at the Buffalo Dry Dock Company. She was christened with the traditional smashed bottle of champagne by Miss Mary Dempster, the daughter of William Dempster, who ran the Buffalo Machinery Company. The next boat in the fleet made history when it was launched. It was Saturday, February 28, 1903, as the Wolven Canaler S.N. Perrant launched at Wyandotte. She was the first major steamship launched on the Great Lakes without a christening ceremony. Next off the ways was the Robert Wallace, launched at Buffalo on April 11, 1903 at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. She was christened by Miss Elizabeth Thomas. Although for reasons unknown, Mr. Wolven was leaning toward launching his boats without christenings. Apparently, some in the shipbuilding community were highly superstitious about that. This showed up at the South Chicago Shipyard on the 9th day of May, 1903, when the Wolven Canaler, John Lambert, was ready to slide down the ways. Yet, no christening ceremony had been planned. Someone at the shipyard ran and recruited Miss Fanny Davis, an office stenographer, handed her a bottle of wine, and she became the person to christen the Lambert. 
Just 19 days later, however, the Wolven Canaller George C. Howe was launched from that same shipyard without ceremony. On Saturday, June 13th, the John Sharples was launched at Superior, Wisconsin, again without ceremony. June 28th saw another shipyard trying to hold on to the tradition as the Albert M. Marshall was christened with the smashing of a bottle of champagne on her stem by Miss Mary Louise Westcott at Wyandotte. South Chicago closed its contract with Wolven on Saturday, June 27th, with the unceremonious launching of the John Crerer. The Superior Shipyard also closed its Wolven Canaler contract when on July 3rd they launched the H.G. Dalton without ceremony. Likewise, there was no ceremony for the launching of the final Wolven Canaler, A.D. Davidson, on August 6, 1903, at Wyandotte. These launchings of six out of ten boats without christenings was a woven thing in those days. Proof of that is he also had his big oar boat, James Reed, and the giant oar boat, D.M. Clemson, launched without ceremony. Yet, when his namesake, the 560 foot Augustus B. Woven, was launched at Lorraine, Ohio on Saturday, April 9, 1904, there was plenty of fanfare. The local Chamber of Commerce sent out engraved invitations to attend the launching. And there was even a parade. Now, the Woven Canalers went straight to work. Normally, they carried a crew of 19, including the captain. Let's take a look at a Woven Canalers cabin layout. This is the planned arrangement from August 1902. Starting aft, we see that much of the access is along this single hallway. Note that at each end, there's a hatchway in the outer hull plating. This stairway leads directly into the engine room. Here we have the oiler's room. This is where the chief engineer and second engineer were quartered. Here is where the most important crew members were housed. The first and second cooks. All four deckhands were squeezed into this room. Both firemen were housed here. Imagine being aboard on trips from Lake Superior to Montreal and having just two men shoveling the coal. This is the cruise mess. Here's the officers and guests dining room. This is the kitchen and serving area as well as storage. And finally, there is the aft water closet and bathroom. Now let's look forward. We'll start here with the owner's room, which is also the guest quarters. Notice that it has its own bathroom, as well as one large bed and one, two bunk beds. Next we see the first and second mate's room and the captain's room plus the forward cruise water closet, which is a polite 1902 way to say toilet. These companionway stairs lead up to the wheelhouse, also known as the pilot house. Now, in looking at all this, you may wonder, what about the watchman and the wheelsman? Where are they housed? Interestingly, they were quartered under the bridge wings. The wheelsmen here, and the watchmen here. Some of the woven canalers were eventually given triple whirly cranes on their deck. 
Here we see the Perrant having hers installed sometime after 1910. Not all of the woven canalers were modified in this manner. Some of these vessels had long careers in other fleets, yet two of them, the Davidson and the Lambert, were sunk by U-boats during World War I. The Sharples, however, was called up to serve in both World Wars but she was requisitioned too late to actually serve in World War I. So she never made it outside of the lakes. Yet she did serve on salt water during World War II as the Fleetwood. She entered the war late and she survived only to become surplus and was listed by the U.S. Navy as, quote, hulked, unquote in 1947. It was the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway on April 25, 1959 that spelled the end of most of the little canalers. Only two of the woven class boats survived for some time beyond that. The Dalton worked until she was scrapped in 1970 as the Canadian vessel Mancox. Coincidentally, the very first of the woven class canalers, the Keefe, survived the longest. She went to scrap in 1971 as the Canadian crane boat Manzuti. Now if I've mispronounced any of the names in this video, whoever finds that gets three chances at correctly pronouncing my full name.